What's going on guys, it's Cooper Codes. And in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at the brand new Google Identity Services and using their sign in with Google functionality to create an application where we can sign in and sign out in React. The new functionality from Google makes the login process way more simple and also gives you new things such as the regular sign in with Google button that looks a little different, one tap sign up, and then also automatic sign in, which is something we haven't seen before. The old JavaScript platform designed for the web is now going to be unavailable available for download after March 31st, 2023, and you're not going to be able to create a new project with the old code after July 29th, 2022. In short terms, it's going to be deprecated and you have to switch to the new Google Identity Services code in order to make sure that your Google applications are running and ready to go. All right, so that's just some quick overview. Let's get into actually creating our application. So before we get into the React stuff, we're going to want to go to console.cloud.google.com. This is the Google Cloud platform and it's necessary for us to create our project and create a client for our login and logout to use. So you should see a page like this, go to the search bar on the top and then go to credentials and make sure it's credentials under APIs and services. From here, you're going to see that you need to create a project in order to use this. So press the create project button. You can name the project whatever you want. I'm just gonna call it test login and then you can just create that. You should get a little warning here that says, remember to configure your consent screen. If it's not showing this, look up OAuth consent screen and it will bring you to the same place. So I'm gonna press configure consent screen here. The OAuth consent screen is that little screen you see whenever you log into a page using Google. It will say, do you want this website to use your profile picture, email, whatever. And the consent screen exists so it can ask specifically, do you want it to access your YouTube, for example? Do you want it to access your Google Docs? So for our user type, we're going to do an external user. Press create, make an app name. I'm just going to call this test login again. And then you need a mandatory email for these here. So just take an email that you, you know, can use. You're also going to need a mandatory email under the developer contact information and then press save and continue. Since we're just using Google authentication, we don't need any scopes to any APIs actually. So we can just press save and continue here. Then your test users are super important. When testing your app locally, you have to have the email you're attempting to log in show up in these test users. So I'm going to use an email, which is going to be my test user. I'll use later in the video. It'll be deskspacing at gmail.com. But if you try to log in with any other email, it's not going to work when you're in the testing or local stage. So once you have the emails you want to log in with locally during your testing, press save and continue. Then you'll be provided with a little summary. Just press back to dashboard at the bottom here. All right, so we don't have to worry about any of this now. We can now press on credentials and then we're going to want to create credentials and we're going to want to create an OAuth client ID. You're going to want to choose your application type. Since we're creating a React application, I'm going to choose web app right here. This is a super important part of the video is you need the HTTP local host for local testing and you also need the HTTP local host at port 3000. You need both of these. You didn't need both of them before, but now you need both of them. So down here in your redirect URIs, you're also going to need to do this. And I'm choosing port 3000 because that's the default port on React. If you're watching this video, maybe using a different framework or just using a different port, Whatever port you're testing locally on, let's say it's 4000, make this localhost 4000. I'm just going to name this web client one for now and we can press create at the bottom. So you're going to want to take your client ID and your client secret and save these. I believe the client secrets only showed once, so you seriously want to make sure that you get your stuff here, but you can always find your client ID again. But save this somewhere where you have access to it later because I'll tell you guys to go grab your client ID later. Once you have the client ID, that's all we need from the Google side. So now let's get started creating our React application. So I open my VS code to a fresh new folder and you can use whatever terminal you want, whatever text editor you want. It's not gonna really matter here, but go to an empty folder and say npx create-react-app. I'm going to name our React app client for this video. And this video assumes that you have NPM installed. And so if you don't look up NPM install online, it's just a relatively easy install and it will make it so you can run stuff like npx create react app in your terminal. Once that is done, I'm going to cd into my client in my terminal, and then I'm going to open up the folder over on my text editor here. First thing that we're going to do, which is a super important part of this tutorial, is we're going to go into the public file, and then we're going to go into index.html. This is the boilerplate HTML of your React application, and generally your entire application sits inside of this div id equals root. But if we want to do things like include outside scripts to our React, what we can do is we can then change the head of this HTML. There is a script provided by Google, which is this, 
I'm going to put this in the comments so you guys can copy paste it. But Google specifically asks you to have this script and also asks for a sync and defer to make the script load faster. So once you put the script in, make sure to save the index.html and that is all we will do to edit this file. So now we can close up that public folder and now we can go into source, which is generally where we do most of our React development. And we can go into app.js. So as normal, this is just the regular app.js. You have all of your header HTML code in here or JSX code. We can delete the entire header because we're not going to deal with this boilerplate for this application. And so delete everything except that outside div. So the first thing we want to do in our React application is we want to initialize our Google client with our client ID. And we also want to initialize the button for logging in. This initialize code, we only want to run once. And we can run something once at the beginning of our renders in React by using the hook called use effect. So we can go to the top and we can import, use curly braces, use effect from React. So use effect is a React hook that we can use like this. The first parameter is the actual effect that we want to run. And so we can do a function here, for example. And we can do the syntax like this. So this first parameter is a function. And the second parameter is just going to be an empty array. The in-depth React look at this empty array is that if anything in this array changes, it's going to run the use effect again. But we only want this use effect to run once, and so we just put nothing in the array and it will only run once in our application. So this is kind of strange syntax if you're not used to React, but since we're using an outside script, we're going to want to put a comment at the top here. It says global Google. This is because this Google object is coming from the script in our HTML, and we can do things like Google dot accounts dot id dot initialize is one of the functions that we're going to be using but our react application doesn't know that google exists but if you go to our index.html this script is going to load before our react content gets loaded and this script is going to give us a couple of different javascript objects we can use in our react.js and so if we don't have this global google the linter is going to say, hey, Google doesn't exist. We have to tell the linter, hey, I know you don't know Google doesn't exist, but we know it's already being loaded in from this script. And so it will ignore any errors where Google isn't defined because it is defined, React just doesn't know that. So using this Google object that we have access to, we can use an initialize function from the accounts. And the initialize function is going to take in two things. It's going to take in a client underscore ID, which is going to be our client ID here. So go to wherever you saved your client ID and then paste it in here. It's also going to take a callback function as its second parameter, which pretty much means that if we ever do a credentials or if someone ever logs in, what function do we want to call? So I'm going to just call this function handle callback response. This is a function we haven't made yet. And so I'm going to create it up here. Function handle callback response. It's going to take that response as a parameter. And so now we have access to the response if anyone tries to log in using our Google client in, in React. The Google accounts also has the functionality to do things like this, Google accounts.id.render button. Then you can tell it the actual DOM element you want. So I'm gonna say document.get element by ID. And I'm gonna say sign in div. We will make this in a second. And then you can pass some parameters as to the theming of the button. So I'm gonna say theme, we're going to do an outline button and the size of the button is going to be large for our case. So inside of our app, we can then do this, make a div with an ID and we can make it equal to sign in div. So this is where our sign in button is going to live. And so let's do this. So we have this response and this response is coming from documentation from the Google identity services. But one thing we know from the documentation is that there is an encoded JWT ID token and it's you can grab that by saying response.credential. All right, so now we have our client initialized. We have a button getting rendered. Let's do an NPM start and see what our application looks like so far. All right, this is great. So if you see a sign in with Google button on the top left that looks something like this, you are in a great spot. That means your script loaded correctly and it also means that your client initialized correctly as well, which is super great. If we press sign in with Google right now, or first let's inspect element and then go to console so we can see any console.logs. And let's try to sign in with Google. And then make sure to choose the account that you have under your test users, like I showed earlier in the video. For example, my account was deskspacing at gmail.com. So I will choose that. It will say confirm you want to sign in as this person. I'm going to confirm. And as you'll see, 
we just got a JSON web token, which is a successful login response, which is super great. The Google Identity Services package is very bare bones in that all it's doing is it's giving you this successful JSON web token, which has a bunch of information that we can decode. Google isn't really handling anything for you. It's expecting you to go and then handle this JSON web token as a successful login response. All Google is doing is saying, on our side, this person actually is deskspacing at gmail.com and they logged in successfully. Here's a JSON web token showing that they logged in successfully and who it is. So the cool thing here is this, if you're unfamiliar with JSON web tokens, this might be kind of strange, but there is actually information hidden inside of this crazy huge string. We can decode a JSON web token by going to our application again, and then installing a package called npm install jwt-decode. This jwt-decode is going to allow us to decode a JSON web token and get the object that is at the payload of that JSON web token. So if we import JWT underscore decode at the top from JWT dash decode, this is actually a function that we can use to decode JSON web tokens. So we know that this response.credential is a JSON web token. So we can say var user object is equal to JWT decode and then that JSON web token we're discussing. If you're not familiar with JSON web tokens, that's totally fine. This is just a kind of simple overview of this stuff. And so if I console.log this user object, it will be way more easy to understand. So now that I'm logging this user object, which is decoding that JSON web token we saw, let's npm start again. Let's inspect element. And as you guys will see, you can already see some of this cool new functionality where it recognized who I was before. And so I want to sign in as the same person. Thank you, Google. And you guys will see on the top here in my terminal is the actual JSON web token, just a string. But on the bottom here is the decoded object that that JSON web token string was representing initially. So this decoded object has a bunch of different things that we can use. It has the name of the person, it has their email, it has if their email is verified or not. It also has a picture of that person, whatever picture they have on their Google account. And so this is actually really cool stuff. It means that Google is giving us access to all this information that we can use for our application. For example, if I wanted Google authentication alongside my own authentication system, my own authentication system might have pictures, it might have names, etc. right? And so I can use this JSON web token to know that Google is giving me this information and it's verified from Google that this is a successful login. So we're successfully logging in, but we're not really storing anything. So let's get into that. What we can do to store this stuff is we can use a state in React. So I'm going to import use state at the top here. I'm then going to make the state of a user. So I'm going to say const user and then set user is equal to use state and then an empty object. So use state gives us two things. It gives us the user, which is the actual information, an empty object, and then the setter, which would be the set user function. So if I wanted to set our user as this user object, I would go down here and I would say set user, and then the user object here. I think it's super important to understand that I'm just using a state as an example. If you have a more full stack application or using React is one of your main ways to log in, you're probably going to want to do something like a more global state or something like a Redux to manage this user object. State isn't designed to be used across different components in a super easy to use way. And so whatever your authentication system is outside of Google, you should use whatever that is, whatever it's a cache, whatever it's something like Redux, whatever that is, use that instead of the state. But state is still usable and it does serve a purpose in saving the user's information for this case. So now this user object is getting set to this user over here. And so now we can make a kind of sign in and sign out functionality. So if we have no user, we're going to want to show the login button. So let's comment this out. If we have, let's see, if we have no user, then we want to show the sign in button. If we have a user, show the log out button. And so that's kind of the basic idea of this functionality. And so how do we know if we have a user or not? Well, we can do something like this. So I'm going to use some inline conditional logic here where I'm going to say, if a user exists, then I want to show some things to my React. So we can make a little basic thing to show the basic properties that a user has. So I'm just going to make a div here and the div is going to have a couple things. It's going to have an image. And I believe if we go to our application, we can see that if we were to do user.picture, it would show us this image here. So let's import that. Rob can say source is equal to user.picture. So it should show that image. And then we can also make a little header three 
and we can say user.name. So if we go back to our React application, we should see this information on our page. Okay, so sign in, make sure you're using your test account, and boom, there we go. It's getting the profile picture and the name from our user, which is great news. So if a user signs in, we want to hide this button here. One thing we can do is we can show some pure JavaScript. We can go up to where we log in. And because someone's logged in, we don't want to show the sign in div anymore, right? So we can say document dot get element by ID. And then we can go to the sign in div and we can set its hidden property by saying dot hidden is equal to true. You can imagine it like this. I'm logging in. That means I can't log in again, right? So hide that login button is kind of what we're doing there. And you can imagine when we create the sign in functionality, we want someone to sign out and then show the option to log in again. And so we can use this line of code somewhere else as well. So let's go back to our application, refresh, log in again, and we should see that the button has disappeared. So this is great news. This means that when we have a signed in user, we're not going to be showing that sign in button still, which is great stuff. But now we have to go and create our own sign out button. So we can go down to our code here and we can make a little button for signing out. I'm going to say button on click, I'm going to get the event from the click. And then I'm going to point that event to a function we will make called handle sign out. This is a function we are going to make ourselves sign out for the button here. So let's go make this handle sign out function, we can go up here, handle sign out, uh, we can just get that event. I'm not sure we're going to use it. But I'm just showing you guys that's a possibility if you have a different use case where you might need that event. And so inside this handle sign out, we are managing our cache locally with the state here. And so one thing we want this to do is, okay, if a user wants to sign out, we're going to then set that user to its empty object again. This empty object pretty much is saying if our user is an empty object, we have nothing signed in, we have no person. And if they sign out, we want to show the sign in div again, right? And so we can say, take this line of code from here, and instead of making hidden true, we want to make hidden false, which means we're going to show our sign in div. So they have the option to sign in again. So let's go back to our application. And we're going to see sign in and sign out at the same time. Just for now, we're going to change that in a second. But let's sign in here, use your test account, then we should be able to press sign out. And boom, it's going to show you the sign in button again, which is great news. This means we can sign in and kind of sign out at will. But there's an issue, we don't want the sign out button to show alongside the sign in one. So let's go make some functionality to react to make sure that doesn't happen. This is a little complex, but hopefully I can keep you guys here. So if our user object has any properties, pretty much means if our user object isn't empty, that means we have a user and that means we want to show our sign out button. One thing we can do here is object dot keys user dot length doesn't equal zero. This means that our user actually has full user attributes. And if this ever happens where we have a bunch of user attributes, we know that we have a user who is logged in. And so if a user is logged in, we want to show that sign out button. So we can bring this in here, do the double and at the end to say, if this is true, show this. And now we should only have this button to sign out showing when we have a user who's logged in. So let's go back to our react application. And we should see that the sign out button is not showing here, which is great news. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to sign in as desk again, boom, I'm signed in, we have the JSON web token authenticating great stuff. And then I can press sign out. And boom, we're back to normal again. So this is a basic idea of how you would have this flow work for a Google authenticated user. There, there are some really cool things you can do, such as this one tap dialogue is what Google calls it. I don't know why they call it that. But when we load the page for the first time, we can prompt the user to log in easily. So we can say google.accounts.id.prompt. So this prompt is going to show a little prompt to the right where it will show some accounts you have recently logged in as or just some accounts you have near like Google cache if you're using like Google Chrome, for example. And so you put this prompt and then restart your application. As you'll see, it's prompting us on the right here to log in. And so if I log in through here, like this, it's going to verify. And the cool thing is, we didn't have to change any of our code because that prompt, it still hits the same callback, which is handle callback response here. And so that's the really cool thing is when you have this prompt, it's going to call the same code, it's going to get the same user object, set your user object, do this document hidden true code, and you have another successfully logged in user. And so Google identity services, especially with this new code allows us to create these Google auth logins in a pretty streamlined manner compared to what it was like before. 
All right, guys, so that's pretty much the entire video. You have a React application where you can log in as a Google user. We have decoded that JSON web token coming from Google, and we have the ability to log in and then log out as that user in a React application. Thanks so much for watching.